Coven. Somebody. Sure, 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 what do you think? What do you Hey, Marissa, if uh, you can hear it fine and see it fine, can you give me a okay and we'll get started? Yeah, I can hear it and see your screen. Okay, great. All right, today's kind of an exciting day. We're going to employ some of the things we learned about right to date and get you guys started on your semester long project. Um, nothing too particular, just going to use some global starting points and ways to bring this up to issue by next week. And I'll tell you about what happens next week because uh, what we want to do is get you prepared for that first kind of schematic design presentation. We want to go through a process of me getting involved in your schemes. Um, next by next Tuesday. So I'll talk about that in a second. So our uh, landmark building, the UNESCO site, we're going to draw the second half of the class or the second two thirds is the Roby House, which is um, obviously internationally acclaimed. And I think if you ask people on all corners of the planet, uh, what's right is known for, it's actually this view on the corner of 57th and Woodlawn down by the University of Chicago. Right when you come to that intersection, he's on the, get this right now, he's on the northeast side of the street. So the living room here faces due west and the body of the building faces due south. So it's great solar exposure through the course of the year. And so the, body, the, the building like we talked last week is responding to the site. It's a tight, narrow, long site. And at that point in the, um, 1906 period when they started, there was nothing across the street to the south. So a very expansive view to the south and the idea of the prairie language there. So um, this is where we're going to get to eventually. But first, we're going to work through this idea of how we go about scheming and schematic design. And we'll move forward with that.
Okay, so um, the principle today will be to activate your work of your initial designs because hopefully the bulk of you are midway through or maybe finish your bio already. You've done enough sort of cursory films into the book proper. You've done um, two with me so far. We've talked about diagramming, things like that. So now the notion is how do we how do we catalyze this as we go through your semester and take the bits and pieces from what you're reading about, what uh, you've seen in the book so far, what you've seen in the film so far, and try to make that um, align your strategy between the two different types of house typologies Wright worked with. In really sort of chicken neck nuggets kind of global sense, it's either the prairie homes up until uh, the last one he did, which is the home for wing spread for Mr. Hibbert Johnson in the early, late 20s, early 30s is his last prairie home. And then we did sort of post depression and the Usoni is born. So you're gonna choose one of those paths that go down. I know a lot of you have written me and told me who your client is. Um, don't panic, you can be your self client, you can invent a client. It's just sort of a study. So you're writing a piece of poetry, it happens to be an architecture. So what we're gonna work with today is, um, is I think because it's a writing language, you really ought to be working in some type of a grid base because that grid base is going to help you solve the pieces of the puzzle because everything we do in plan type is going to have some type of geometric relationship, one part to another part. And so that's a good way to have a grid. The standard one I ever use is probably an eighth inch, quarter inch, or half inch. In this case, it's quarter inch. And that's good for us because your schematic design this semester is only at eighth inch. And so that means every square here is relative to two feet. So informationally, you're always sort of on target. Even when you're scheming, you're going to be sort of relative in scale. So what I want you to do is think about what your choice was. And you can follow me through here today and what I'm going to present to you. And then say you can convert that. This is going to take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to kind of get this first piece knocked out and see how that can then inform. I want you to go through the same process on your own, what you've done so far to sort of force you to generate images based on how you're thinking about this house and this client and the type of home you want to do for your term paper, so to speak, for this seminar. So the tools here, obviously, uh, what I'm going to do here, we'll save the uh, Prismacolor pencils for the actual rendering later of the Roby house. We're, I'm just going to work in a flare now, just because I can sort of uh, write in a font as well as draw and be more articulate with the black here. And that way it might be a little more uh, comic book like in terms of the information here and not quite so pretty as the final picture. So what I want you to think about is here's your platen for design in terms of the language. And what I want you to kind of move, because obviously this is a, a 2D piece, right? Two dimensions, length and width. And yet what we want to talk about in both of these schemes, which Wright's known for, is the Z axis. So X and Y are the 2D, Z is the vertical one that comes out of the ground and makes this thing a Wrightian statement. So we're going to move from the 2D to the 3D on this sheet of paper, hopefully. What you're going to, what I'm going to show you quickly here, you're going to replicate for your own scheme and your own site and your own client here. And so the tools here are what you can draw and kind of diagram, but also what I'd like you to think about is the sloppiest type of model possible. So go around your apartment, your studio, and just collect board stocks, paper stocks, foam core stocks, what's ever left over. Go in the, the trash can by that's got some residual stuff and then scale it so that you wanna figure out that what piece relative to what we're working at an eighth of an inch here has got the notion of being eight feet tall, which will be sort of living the space height as a generic piece here. So there is an eight foot, section eighth of inch equals feet of this little type of balsa wood stock which was left over from another model i did before and it's hanging around the office here so i picked up that piece and then here's a six foot version of it a little bit thicker stock and then there's a little shorter two and a half foot potential wing wall for us to use here's some foam core i saw i found and the foam core is the thickest stock in terms of wall section. So this might be an interior wall, that might be an exterior. This could be patio stuff, it's actually watercolor paper. And this is just paper stock from the Xerox machine. So find your stocks like that and then play with this as if this is part of your tools of working as a sculptor within the realm of the prairie or within the realm of the Usonian. 
So once you have to decide, I can't take the time the next 20 minutes to go through the probably 30 minute process I went through, because that's something you don't have to wait for. I'm going to go through stages now quickly to show you how you're going to build this up and get to our prize residual piece that I want you to submit to me by next week. So we're going to sculpt with this in the notion that what Wright really worked with, and this is typically of most, art, most architects, is the plan. Oops, and I picked up the pen that's on. I think the plan is determinant. Because you can't get any more information per square inch in architecture than the floor plan. Because once you read the floor plan, you project up and show your information vertically in terms of how the space performs. And you can't get you can't get that from an elevation, you can't get that from a section, but in a floor plan, it speaks the most of the least amount of information drawn. So we're going to work from a plan type directly into this is something that Wright did with his clients all the time, into 3D image. And that's what I want you to submit in a week in terms of how we can kick this out through a very sloppy model, through a little bit of photography, through printing, and a little bit of drawing into the print. So you've got this idea of where you want to head for the actual grade you're going to have on February 28th, which is just submit your final initial schematic design. So to expedite this, I don't want to have to design something new for you. We're going to design something as if we are Frank Lloyd Wright, and we're going to take it off of a very simple plan from the early 1930s, post-depression, where he used to solve the problem of what he had solved as a prairie architect, and now do it for less for middle America or even lower middle America in terms of what people can afford back then. So he projected in a, an article once that he could do a house for $5,000 and Mr. Herbert Jacobs called him on it and said, build me a house for $5,000. So we're gonna use this as a reference point here in terms of how I want you to articulate your kind of sloppy model here. Then we'll work into that to kind of do a, a full presentation sheet. So this is Jacobs one. So we are on the Usonian side of this equation, but it could have been done if I picked a prairie home too, a simple prairie like let's say the Barton house and Buffalo is a nice simple prairie, bigger square footage the Usonian is trying to tamp down on square footage to make it more affordable. And yet both bound with tons of ideas. So what we wanna sort of uh, get at here is what would Wright have thought about before he came with the final plan for the Jacobs? And he would have thought about the notion of here is my tree trunk that runs through the house as sort of a cruciform shape of entry into all the wet areas, the kitchen area, the fireplace, the hardscapes, and the anchor for the branches of his tree that grows vertically up the Z axis and the branches of the sleep area and the entertaining area kind of fall off to either side. And that's his premise as you read about this in biography where he's establishing this code from Prairie and now stripping it down to what's the least amount of money you can spend and still achieve the same quality of space. So this is what happens in the 1930s. And then justifiably ends up Jacobs one. There's a second one that Jacobs family had him design as a world heritage site. And again, I mentioned this last week, this, Floor plan is probably smaller than most of your apartments. It's 1,142 square feet, I believe. So it is diminutive. It is probably the, the absolute smallest building on the planet that's on the World Heritage Site. And certainly the most renowned uh, cost or design per square foot image that Wright ever created, bar none, because it's so effective in terms of its principles. And then begat. Um, the mid-century modern craze across America, which a lot of clients now are delving back into now that we're 70 years away from the mid-modern. So uh, with that in mind, let's assume this is our sort of plan type diagram. And I'm just going to draw this over here as a sketch. Let's back up and say what happened a week before he did this drawing. He would have had these key aspects anchor the site in terms of the conditions. And if this is the site on the property, He's on a corner site in this neighborhood. So here's the hard edge to the lot. And he kind of pushes this L-shaped home up to this corner. So he has a great southeastern exposure here. And he puts sort of very formal front on the west. 
And so that's basically prototypically the, the plan typology of the Jacobs One House. And that's how we see it here in terms of direction. You see north is up and we'll keep that north up. And all your plans you submit all semester long. If you rotate them for me, I'm gonna assume north is up. So that's the, that's the didactic idea of how architects talk to each other. North is always up. You adjust your work to make sure north is up on the page. And that way you've got the consensus. I also see here Wright was very fanatic about saying that little square is two feet like I just said. And that's why I would Xerox to reduce this or maybe enlarge it to match this so that every two feet in here matches my grid over there so I could play with this in the schematic form as well. So I'm not asking you to look at Wright's work. I'm asking you to look at your design and implement that into a sort of a doodle of a floor plan in terms of how you want to exercise your right as the architect to tell your client, I'm going to give you a three bedroom, two bath home within X number of square footage. And maybe yours might be closer to 1500 square feet. And I'm gonna start by just laying out principal spaces on the site you're working with and see how it fits and what the setbacks are until you finally are comfortable with something that might just work. Now the idea is you're in that plane of X and Y, that's the floor plan, width and length, and there's no sense of scale or depth to it. So you want to allevi alleviate this right now in terms of the presence of what it's doing for us. And we want to build up those walls I talked about, which are scaled at the minimum of eight feet of living. So we're right projected out to have these major pieces. You can then take over your scheme too and start to celebrate by cutting up the members and showing pieces of material that you're actually going to bring the space up and now I'm going to fast forward to wing walls and then extensions of walls to the left and right to a point where I think it took me about 15 minutes yesterday afternoon to piece together. Um, let's see, where's the model over here? There. Uh, just a second. Have I had to pull it? Two, after using um, probably seven or eight sheets of this sort of paper product, you can see the floor plan below. I sort of articulated the walls, the model I wanted to build, and it simply then put some planes on the top side to articulate the massing on the site. So if I used a piece of cardstock here, without spending any time to make this any type of a finished model whatsoever, I can then tilt this up. And so we get a sense of having a view shed of what I want to really look like on the site. And so the key here then is to make sure when we go to the next step, you actually lift your model up to a point where the roofs are above your eye height, if that's an eight foot wall. So that in the horizon line of the perspective, it ends up mid wall between the ground and the surface of the roof pitch above. And obviously you can rot this, rotate this around and get different view sheds to see what view you wanna look at next. But really in terms of a matter of minute, obviously those of you who might be very fast and very articulate with SketchUp, and other sites like that, fine, use that type of website. For those who just want to work and craft with some uh, handmade product and kind of walk in the, in the realm of how Wright did it himself, which is scraps of paper to, to move things about until he settles on that perspective he thinks is important for the view, that's what Wright would show the clients. So he would move from the plan which the clients can read to the next, next piece of architectural graphics, which is the perspective. That perspective then shows them key aspects of how they see the world in perspective instead of the architectural expression, which is always a little bit more obtuse for the general public of elevations, which are flat and non-realistic sections, which are constructionally heavy and show the construction process, but the homeowner doesn't care about that either. They just wanna see what does my bedroom look like? What does the kitchen look like? What's your relationship to the garden looks like? And that happens in perspective. So you move the process of your series of pieces 
into a little lightweight sculpture. And again, this could be a 15 to 30 minute essay for all of you. And now it gives you that stepping stone and to articulate something more sophisticated for my review as well. So if we took this, and we simply laid it out and then got your cell phones out, all I'm asking you to do is photograph it from the two key views that you'd wanna show your client. I know some of you have real clients, some of you have fictitious clients, and some you're the client for yourself. But what are those two views you'd show the general public? In this case, this is the street view looking to one edge of Jacob's one with the carport over here. I'm using that as my model. And then here it is the famous Southeast Garden Edge, which is kind of protected and allows people in the depression to actually, in a very sort of a sustainable environmental way today, is grow their own produce on a little bit of a farmette, so to speak, adjacent to the home that's protected from the public realm necessarily. And there's the bedrooming behind it, and there's the shaft of the chimney flue that takes that vertical shaft up and have these planes of space floating about. So whether, whatever your lighting is like, and this was just taken on a desktop by a window, you can see the sun was very kind of nice and lit up some of these aspects. You may have to go into uh, taking those things into Photoshop and kind of desaturate them. So you lose some of the energy of the room light you're working in, and you're working with something much brighter and you can draw into them because that's our final step here in this process. So this whole thing I'm talking about I'm going to try to get done within 30 minutes here. It'll probably take you at the tops one hour to generate the scheme we're talking about. So uh, working with the plan type you had, and obviously not going to be articulated, by the time you're done this semester, you'll have a plan just like this. Not like the Jacobson specifically, but you'll have a delineated floor plan, which is going to be critiqued as, is this home actually appropriate for a client out there as a third party? So we're going to pull back off of that. And what we're going to do is work into the prints from your camera. So I'm going to start with first is the exterior view from the street. And this is only printed eight and a half by 11. So I'll zoom in a little bit here. Oops, that's brightness, wrong way. Zoom in. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so I can fill up the sheet more. So your first job when you get a photograph of the home proper is to articulate your software between your ears in terms of how you see the world and where is that horizon line, which is absolutely flat across at your eye height standing on the street looking at the home. Okay, and that's really dictated by the idea of the grid paper down below I had at all these values in perspective rushing back to one point on the horizon line, it shows up right there. Unfortunately, in this dark zone, but that's the right vanishing point. Now the left, because it's very difficult to have two points on the same page, same drawing page. If you did, it'd be a very small drawing we're gonna do. In this case, we want the drawing to fill the page. So the left point is well off the left side of the drawing here but we see the edge of this nice cantilevered roof go back and show us where it is, and then hit the point of the corner of it, and then return to our right vanishing point, which eventually come over here. The, the, the twin to this roof line that comes out the front of Jacob's one, rushes over here, hits its corner, and goes back to this point very sharply on that edge. So those are the two planes of Jacob's one, which float above this space. And then to kind of celebrate what it's anchoring on the site, we've got that vertical chase of the chimney, which has its corner and rushes back to the left point, rushes back to the right. And then it is broader on this side and thinner on that side. So that's the chimney that rushes up and kind of anchors those things. And now to set it on the ground, what Wright would do was he'd use walkways, plantings, the landscape design, which is going to reinforce the idea this is a series of planes in space. So right where there's a breach of the main living space coming off that left point grid, he brings out a little half wall and runs that out to the sidewalk out front, which coming from the left vanishing point comes across over here and eventually returns 
by the street edge, the end of property, which would have been way over here, probably off the page. So there's sidewalk and there's parkway and then finally the street. So that shows how close Wright would build the extent of his landscape design that kind of ties into the city grid and then sets back and makes it a very private living space here because the only windows that show up on this western edge are way up high in terms of clear stories. So they let light in, they let breezes in when the windows are open, but it's really sheltered to make this thing sort of like a, a clam that opens up with its oystered front to the southeast where the garden is. And then the underside of the carport hits the corner on the far end and then floats back to that right vanishing point. And that's the really sort of aggressive part of Jacob's one that it's known for is that Wright starts to really accessorize homes to make sure the automobile is very prominent. And Wright loved his automobiles, as you saw in every chapter in the biography you're reading. He loved the Cherokee red paint colors on him. He drove way too fast. They took away his license when he was in his 80s. But he loved the idea of that being part of the manufactured idea of the American lifestyle from the Depression on. So we can give some of the language of the types of ideas of material you want to do in this at this point and say there's the masonry that's going to be in the main frame there and then I'll take a type of nice ship laugh siding with a front any type of architectural detail or applied ornament this is all manufactured lumber it's off the shelf it's much less expensive than those early prairie homes this is a little secondary wall that pops out in the back from the living space this pops out, you see a little bit of the front door moving back in here. And that's about all you're allowed to see then on this front side over there, this is the stone wall. And then he has vegetation which reinforces this along the way. And you can detail that later on, but this, this is gonna be an idea that how you see your space in perspective very quickly, without having to do a whole lot of perspective skills because you've got the model that tells you where the vanishing point is and how you can articulate that. So we we'll use the whole idea of value and we'll kick underneath that plane and show those dark areas working around here. And then even to this day, the owner of Jacobs One, for you Madison students online tonight, if you walk over this neighborhood, which is on the other side of the University Hill there, as you get close to that um, shopping complex off the university, you go in this neighborhood and you'll stumble across the Jacobs One home. It's that close to you guys. So if you do that, you'll see that the owner still has I believe it's a 1964 um, hardback Saab sports car in the red of Wright's choice that sits out in front. Is that that's sort of the, the little bit of ornamental detail that, that needs to be near the home. So Wright would encourage people to really celebrate the auto industry and kind of put them on. But then without having walls around there, because he said, all you really need to do is keep the snow and the rain off of it because the car doesn't have to be warm. So he'll, he'll eliminate that structure of a typical garage to keep the cost down. So that's kind of the frontal view there. We can kind of sit it down by saying, here's a grade. And then there's the parkway. Got to highlight the sidewalk being a brighter tone in the grass. And then in the backdrop, um, because it's a southern exposure, he has I'm not sure it's original pine, but there still is a master pine out here in the front. But then that kind of cups away as you get the light from the southeast part of the lot. And you see some of the neighboring trees and they become taller on the north side. So he uses the language of the trees then to make that a darker tone where you want to have the house protected by foliage, where you don't need the sunlight coming at from the north. So that's kind of what happens on the property there. And as a design tool, nature is a great way to act as be one of your weapons on this drawing tableau to articulate how you want that vegetation to kind of help. And then when there's a neighbor house over here, there could be a hedge then that comes in very dark as another type of wall that shelters and creates privacy zone on that side of it. So that's Jacob's one. And that with your plan type, which will be sort of a cruder version of that, is what I'm asking you to kind of submit um, next week. And uh, my goal is to have you all submit well before class, because if you can get those in my email box and submit them by 11 a.m. Tuesday, 
214. That'll give me a chance. Oops. That'll give me a chance to print those out while I'm at school and doing office hours and working on the research stuff. Um, I'll print those out and I'll have the whole afternoon to take them home and draw into them because it'll slow us down to try to work through all your projects one at a time unless I have drawn into them already. And I'll put them in groups so you can see your peers and see what advanced stage they're at and see what kind of similarities there are between you. And then as we get more articulate after the first 10% grading of these is I'll put you in more discrete groups. So you'll have peer groups giving you feedback as well as the project kind of matures. So that's the one view of it. We come back to the other, which is where? Right here. And this is the garden side. So I'll work with this a little bit quicker. Again, it's the same process. You photograph this. Make sure what's really critical is because a lot of times people, when they when they take a photo with their phone, they're not looking about their vantage point with the subject. In this case, make sure you don't set your camera up until your eye height is right about six feet high relative to something in scale in your model. So in this case, I said it's an eight foot wall, so it's six foot there and two feet above that. That's where you want the middle of your camera lens to be to shoot it. We don't want to look down in the house because the homeowners are going to see it that way. You don't want to be on the ground looking up. We don't want a worm's view. We want somebody standing on the sidewalk looking at the garden. And so find that line and make sure you shoot from that point. So again, now this one shows that here is the north-south wall moving across. That's going to tell us eventually that our point is just off the page over here. Here's the base of this wall coming out. If we came back through the house proper, that'll meet and show us that it's on the vanishing point. And then the length of the property, here's where the south edge then meets the neighborhood sidewalk. This is probably a property line over here, something coming very close. But this facing southeast is the morning light, which grows sort of the idea of all these homes back in the 30s. To beat the Depression, you'd grow a lot of your own food. So these farmettes were born in the scheme of Usonia. And so when you read about Broadacre City, that's Wright's vision for the future of American towns being predicated on the idea of these Usonian homes anchor the, anchoring the, the town down in terms of each house would have enough acreage on its property. So in a sense, it's, it's rural American democracy at, at its finest. And the Usonian home is going to be the prototypical aspect for it. So once you, once you design this up, you'll have, again, for your little MACAT model, you'll have the same perspective for that massing that looks from a different light. Here's the taller floating plane, the carport up above. Here's the single story plane there. And you can tell as, you're, as you draw this up, you're going to make your own design decisions along the way. So your initial model will change by the time you do this drawing as you add things to it and create, for instance, a fenestration. So in this case, the wall stops about here in terms of that wooden siding I mentioned before. And then for the sake of the architecture, this is all opened up facing that southwest until this last little bit as a return. And now the spaces aren't quite so uh, open with fenestration on this side because that's the bedroom wing. And then finally, sort of the master bedroom wing at the last tip over here. It is a three bedroom home, but they're very sort of small, tight utility bedrooms where you really go there to sleep. It's not a place to really um, spend much of the day in. So that's all we need to see the first turn two, which is how you're working from 2D to 3D, how your ideas are evolving around the idea that Wright wasn't a classical architect, which is all about the elevation and composition along axes. He's more of a modern master that dealt with volume and the movement of people on the site. And that's what will be explicit when you turn these sketches in uh, next week at 11 o'clock. If you don't make the 11 o'clock cutout, you probably won't be reviewed or talked about in the uh, lecture next Tuesday night. Because I just, I can't be doing this all afternoon checking who turned in late. So 11 o'clock is the final deadline for that. We have 63 people, so it's going to be hard enough as it is if you turn them all in time. So the sooner the better. And then again, just to kind of give some language, there's that northern side that's got more of the foliage and vegetation. That one master pine is over here on the edge. And this kind of opens up again to the southeast. So there's great south light here. Now, again, I'm not forcing you to work her to freehand here. I think it's the greatest tool in terms of you actually getting involved in design when it's your pinpoint making decisions. 
But if you've learned to kind of translate your creativity to a software program, that's fine too. Just don't overkill for now. We're just talking about schematics. So this then is what I'm looking for in terms of, and you can decide if you want to reduce the plan this time and make these all three. I suppose if we looked at, let's see, 11 by 17 sheet, hypothetically, we might be able to just get if the plans reduced a little bit and kept in scale, we could probably even get your entire presentation here with two perspectives and one floor plan and one sheet of paper. And that way we'll have this great kind of collection of ideas kind of spinning around which you're eventually going to get to a point where you complete this, <clears throat> where this sort of little, and this is really sort of the germ of all your ideas anyway. This is like my favorite type of model is the initial ideas. Whereas this, which is an RP print of the Jacobs One House, is lovely too, because this is the modern master and glory with UNESCO site, but it's finished and it's complete. So it seems like the the, the loveliness of this sort of died off now and now it's a hard kind of brittle design scheme. So, but in a semester, that's the goal is that you will be able to convert what you've worked to into an STL file and print out your scheme. So you'll have a copy and you can drop off a copy for me too. So that's the notion of how we go from the scheme of an idea and plan type to the three-dimensional aspect, to end of semester types of a product piece that you'd actually show a client and ends up in your archive of portfolio work. And then, then speaking of the portfolio work, um, here's a little contemporary lesson of what we're working on for a a kind of um, I'm going to call you Sony in the same type of product. We're only a couple of days into it, but here's the stuff laying around the office. And now it's sort of a town home, kind of affected by right in the modern movement. If you type the kind of stack up three Usonics in the same site, that's where we are with this now. And so we can then photograph and draw into it, kind of change materials and show light and show very, very schematic, rough, crude things so that the client can actually get involved in the process. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so our next step then, let's see. Yeah. It's going to work with the second in your array of base drawings down here at the bottom right it says rob that's roby so let me zoom out a bit so rob for roby that's the sheet you should have out there now we're going to work into that so i'll be talking and drawing and showing the kind of design schematics of um probably his singular most impressionable iconic image of his career is this corner we're going to draw on the roby house So uh, you see the model already. So we're going to head here. We're going to look at this corner and see this great cantilever piece of architecture floats over the connection from the tip of an iconic diamond-shaped stained glass window onto an outdoor living dining space. It actually was a little bit of a dumb waiter so that the staff could bring foods from below, which is a raised basement area and then comport them up to the place where people are through a little dumbwaiter up to there so that it was kind of a way to connect the kitchen to the outdoor spaces. So we'll talk about the hows and whys of Roby as designed it here, but before we get too far, let's just look back in terms of what you know from the reading so far in terms of how did we get to the Roby. So as a, a student, not much student of life, a student of architecture, um, not much older than you are now, uh, he attends the 1893 fair and uh, comes away more impressed with Japanese pavilion than with the City of Light, uh, the, the project that Burnham and all the East Coast architects wanted to create Paris by the lake. So Wright came back from this Japanese pavilion and implemented in a scheme that year. Um, 
in River Forest called the Winslow Home. And it's not as if it's, it's a great building because it's part of the lexicon of right, but it's not a true full stage prairie home because as they say here, it's writing on the front, sort of a, a, a stretch prairie version of the Queen Anne at the time, but it's very sort of jumbled and more functionally Richard Sony on the back where each individual form has its own identity. So it's less groomed on the back. So it shows kind of a, a double-sided view on architectural take. But in terms of our promise here, it's got this language of having a very strong horizontal up to the first floor and a segment which changes for the upper area and then a hip roof, which is dominant in terms of the culture of how it sits on the site. It's very monumental, it's very axial. He also picks up on Mesoamerica ideas of a triumvirate you see in altars down in uh, the different types of Mayan uh, cultures down in Central America, which Wright would draw from because he's looking for something that's not European, but if it was American based, it seems like it's fair game. So he's still looking at different parts of the history of America to inform his architecture. So in a sense, this front skin here is the sort of the dawn of the celebration of these prairie ideals, which are going to mature all the way to the final idea some oh, 17 years later. Thanks. Okay, so the, the end game for this to show Wright's career, and this is probably the most fantastical part of the biographies, is this shift, seismic shift in his personal life right around the Roby House. Because as you know, he starts this in 1907 and 1908 as a great commissioner for another wealthy businessman at the time, Frederick Roby. Um, I think he was 28 when he got right to be his architect and he had a lot of money to build this and had a lot of social life at the university that he wanted to live down by, by uh, South Woodlawn there. So it was a very provocative type of client meets architect. And yet um, his business went up very quickly and he had to sell short to another owner who basically sold his house in 1926 when he owned the Roby to the Chicago Theological Seminary. So not only was Wright walking away from this project in 1909 was being built, uh, he went off to Europe to then celebrate everything that came from the Winslow House to the Roby House. So that Wasmuth portfolio that I keep mentioning and you keep seeing in the books is an absolutely seminal part of the growth of the modern movement globally. Because the modern movement doesn't exist yet. This is still arts and crafts architecture. This is still kind of perceived as the 19th century warming over to the 20th century. So all the trappings are there to be called modern architecture, but it isn't known as that until later on. So with that, there's the notion that Wright leaves and there's a whole sequence of homes. We could go through a whole array of great prairie homes along the way. We did the Unity Temple, and we already drawn that, and that's already up by 1906. So he's accomplished a lot in the Oak Park, River Forest, Chicago area to as a complete career. So when he goes to Berlin, after he leaves his wife and his kids behind and goes off with Mae Machaney, he does his portfolio of his finest prairie work. And so this is the pinnacle piece that we're going to work to and kind of show that accomplished aspect of it. Angel. Dad. That's okay. So our first step, as always, is going to articulate the notion of how to find that horizon line. And so I've given you that kind of venue for that by showing over here on the right, the right vanishing point, which will be on the paper. That was a key to most of these sketches this semester. So you always have one point to work with. So as you find that point, you know then there's a horizontal line across the whole page, which will organize the sketch. And that's the eye height of somebody standing on that famous corner in Chicago that's gonna organize this elevation in uh, the two elevations in perspective here on the corner of 57th and Woodlawn. So uh, to kind of harken back to what's important to us in perspective drawing, we're going to try to find that one decisive box is that going to help reinforce things and then add pieces onto that. So the one that's really kind of uh, the most important to us is the one over here on the left, which has two vertical sides to it, which are going to be the front of that box we sketched out of wood the very first day in class and to show the diminishing side of the angles of the left side of it. So rushing back to the left vanishing point over the paper and then from the base 
back to that point, show the left vanishing point is two or three inches off from the paper to the left. But that's the main block of that part I just showed where it's the raised basement. And then people dined on top of that as they were served by a type of dumb waiter elevator that would walk up and bring the food out. So that's nice for us though, because once you get to that cubic volume, it's going to turn this corner like all perspectives do that are orthographic and then rush back to that right vanishing point. So there we have sort of that plinth that this whole um, prairie project sits on as it's, I wouldn't call it a really urbanistic environment. It seems more kind of suburban residential, but it is on a major um, sort of almost Ivy League university in the Midwest University of Chicago. So it's, it's highly trafficked. And so to remove the force of too much interloping to public and private space, the whole basement creates this sort of base to, to celebrate the sort of template uh, prey structure on the top. So now it's a series of boxes. They're simply going to undulate back and forth as we build out the south side as the, the foot of this. So we'll come to this point, which is ticked out, and that's the end of that front block piece. And then it rot rotates back to the other point. So coming off the left vanishing point, it'll kick out at the top and bottom, and it finds its corner. So that corner ends up a little bit shorter as we build out less towards the south sidewalk. But at that point, it also then returns back to the right vanishing point as we march along this edge. And then at this little tick mark here at the lower level, we have the supportive wing wall that comes out from the base to the full extent of the home here and then returns back to the right vanishing point. So this is very close to our eye height because um, it's sort of a very tall structure here. So that's gonna be on the horizon line to this point and then coming back to the vanishing point all the way to where that wall stops at the edge of the home and the cars can park in the carport over here. Cause this was just about the time where there probably was some discussions with the family, whether or not they're gonna have horses or gonna buy automobiles. Because about 1905, Ford was cranking out enough homes that I think it was probably in the millions by then, where it became an opportunity for most wealthy people to own those cars. So they had that still had a carriage there because you want to have the, the, the deleterious notion of the cars kind of removed from the house proper. So that's kind of our base piece here. As we build up from it, there is the opening of the whole second floor, which has its piece come back to the left. And then it also will rush back to the right vanishing point. And there's our stopping point in the distance. So this is enormous distance from the length of the home. I think the whole home is somewhere around 9,000 square feet. It's gonna be very compressed from our view because we've taken that length of it and we've rotated it. So we're really gonna draw it just from this edge. So you see all that compressed length that we're drawing down to the right vanishing points. So that kind of sets up um, the base, the, the plinth that the house sits on. And now we're going to take what probably the Roby house is most known for is that wildly celebrated cantilever roof. And to make sure we get that precise, we know the edge points here by the tick marks. But again, it's the same left vanishing point. It's all coming down to because it's orthogonal and that's the front tip of it. When we get to the front part that faces south, we'll simply drive that home and that's going to be the cornice line that runs the whole length of the property. So that's a really dynamic horizontal line that tells the people on the inside as well on the outside that we're in prairie country because we're going to honor the horizontal line of the horizon line. So coming back to our right vanishing point, this will rush back and dive into that. The entire way has a great copper guttering system. And then from there, we'll see the the series of casement windows which decorate the dining and living spaces. Now to make this float, we're gonna to come to this opposite corner of it because this doesn't really house space and we see the underside of a plane. This little point actually pokes the sky and rushes back from this point to that right vanishing point too. So it's critical to get that angle in there as well. And then it will be stopped by that crown of that 
triangulated frontispiece of stained glass at the tip of the window. So in a sense, if we were like nautical, we'd say this is almost like a ship on the waterways floating down the cascade waters of the prairie. And so he's got that kind of prominence and then that kind of power of the shift, the master uh, crow's nest up above are done by the thrust of the dual chimneys, which rise up above. And they'll go from left vanishing point to right, left vanishing point to right. So within a couple of minutes here, iconically, you've got a cartoon image that people would know worldwide. They were talking about the Roby House. That's how important this is to obviously UNESCO and the people who want to honor right for these eight sites we're going to draw this semester. Now, to sort of separate again, we've got the lower level, which is basement pulled up. Down here is sort of the kindergarten room for the kids where they'd have some sunshine to the south, but they're, they're behind a wall. They're in a reveal behind here. And then floating above that on the first floor is the main public space, which is living. It comes to the fireplace, and then the see-through part of the fireplace takes you to the dining room just behind it. So on top of that, then, we've got another projecting wall that goes through the plane of the roof. And that's the setup for the second floor and the sleeping areas. And that comes down to a point right there. And then on top of that floats its roof plane. So parallel to this, this will also rush back to the left vanishing point. And this will keep rushing back to the right. Turn the corner, go back to the opposite point, And now I've established all the planes in space. So this type of diagram shown on the European content was shocking in terms of who is this person in the, the central states of the US? Because he's not a proprietor of any coast school system. He's not part of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. He didn't go to Cornell. He didn't go to any type of Beaux-Arts uh, catalog program in the US. And he's, and he's creating these really vigorous types of statements about the future of architecture. So what we're going to do is do a little more detail in here before we start to etch in some of the, the, uh, the quality of how light is held in here just to formalize the space. So on the second floor, right up to the edge of it is the height of those bedroom windows. And then they'll come down and prospect to this corner and then drop down. So you see how that cantilever projects beyond that. Then that's the only little bit. There's obviously second floor windows that we see on the other side of the buildings you wrap around it. That's all a bit from this vantage point of the second floor we'll see. And then the other key aspect for us here is um, this will stop right about here. This returns and now all the way across this twin to it to this end is that recessed underside for the gallery of the kindergarten area in the basement area. So we can come from this point in that open space and project it back towards the left vanishing point, because even the interior space, which are orthogonal, use the same two points too. And we talked about this before, even non-architectural stuff like sidewalk. The sidewalk comes up and just kisses the edge of the masonry here at the base and rushes in the foreground. So that's about the scale of, in the city of Chicago, here, it's probably a six foot wide sidewalk and rushes over there. To help us out a little bit, we're going to cheat the west sidewalk in a little bit closer because right now this is rushing off the page too much and we don't like it when 3D becomes 2D. We want to sort of eliminate the idea of that. So we're going to make this stop and, and have that sidewalk come from the left vanishing point a little bit earlier. That's sort of artistic license. And that way we kind of stop that movement off the page and be blocked by this corner piece. Okay, so along this spine, then just above this space, from right about this point over, is the big array of casement windows, which right option through his prairie career, you've read about this scene and seen it in the other buildings so far, that rather than having double hung windows, which always have a piece of structure right at your eye height, a casement window is all glass vertically. And if they're put in a, in, in a soldiered way of side by side by side, your view from the interior, obviously you see the structure between the casements, but they all act as a horizontal band. So it seems like you're seeing more of the landscape 
because the way the human eyes see side by side, it's a better kind of view shed. So we'll simply come back through here and we'll start just simply with a series of tick marks, which run back and progressively get a little bit smaller as we go back in perspective to make sure we hit enough of those stained glass windows going back on that first floor. And then there's a plinth for another bracket of brick that has a quick return and drops down. And then we've got a little bit of notion of what this triangular area here, it, it doesn't vanish because it's a triangular in pitch. So instead of going back like this, it actually comes up almost perpendicular to us and then comes to a point where it does address the room and drops and then comes back and dresses it again. So there is a little bit of a piece of glazing here, which rotates around to create the crenellated edge to the living space. And how we're gonna make this work to make sure we understand this is glazing is glass is transparent. So the best way to show this piece of paper as being glass is to draw the roof line through it. So when you look inside, you're looking inside the space, and then through the glass on the other side, outside the space, see the sky through the interior. And then there'll be a little bit of some detailing of the glass along there. We won't detail that too much because the subject is the building. And then we'll come back in and thicken up these structural mullions for all the glazing there and do the same for the second floor. So now it seems more like a house and not just a series of planes in space. You can see how he's employing his Freubel language when he's in the kindergarten area. He's talking about the way there's great issues of schematic design principles, just some raw geometries. Uh, there is a, oh, probably 1950s or 60s dormitory here for the Theological Society. It's a sort of banal modern building and probably appropriate to draw it in. We're gonna leave it out just as an artistic reference as if it's back in 1907, 1909. And back there, we'll just leave one of the mature trees, kind of give it a point here. It's going to come back beyond the base of this. And then over on the right, we're going to have a tree from the parkway. And it'll stand up right about in front of the property and then come up and And work its way over onto the edge of our drawing here. And we'll detail that as much as we need to, but it just makes a great sort of frame or bracketing so that architecture is defined by its environment as well as the actual content of the building itself. So that horizontal line then, if we could open up around the corner, that will show the edge of the property over here. So we'll have this wraparound lawn here and eventually in tone. And then the entry isn't even on these two proper streets. The entry is from this side, as you turn, you come back in from the north and make your way deep into the center of the building where the front door is basically on this part of the interior plane, but on that side of the north side of the building. So there's a whole sequence of ideas that Wright does to prepare people to enter the building and find their way through a series of tour, tour, turns left and right over 90 degrees back and forth from this street towards the interior part. And they say the, the magic of it is by the time you made seven ninety returns, you should be in front of the hearth by then. Yes. Yes, I go. Uh, so our next step then is to, uh, before we do some value, we're going to uh, delineate some of the architectural trappings of it. And so this obviously, it's a brick building and you probably read about how um, the budget was kind of stretched out there by having a certain type of Roman brick, which is longer and flatter, so it seems more horizontal. And to pay for the grout change between the horizontal, being different than the vertical plane between the bricks, so that it seemed like it was a consistent red across the whole floor uh, plan of the architecture. And yet it was just a, a change in the coloration of the, of the grout between the brickwork. But there is, on top, there is a casing of the limestone detail which caps and a larger version at the base, sort of so the feet and the hat of the wall. And that simply just wraps around the whole structure following the vanishing points. 
and that helps set the building down. We start to, start to feel like might be a gravitas, a weight to the architecture we're drawing here. And at the top, that cap runs around too, comes back in space. We'll give a little thickness to our roof planes up here. and the caps for the chimneys up top. And there is some celebrated pieces and plinths of brick and stone that rise up at certain corners. On this point here, there's a bump out at the corners of the wing wall out here that rushes out toward the public area. And on top of that sits a large decorative urn which is the marriage of a circle and square. So we'll see the perspective of that. And its twin is down at the far end here. So it's sort of a really diminutive version of that same platform square with a little bit of hemispherical base between it. To give us a quick scale of just how large the building is, we know this is the horizon line where somebody's standing. So um, we can probably put the person's head a little bit above it. articulate somebody walking down that sidewalk towards us. So now our next step, which you know from the early work is to cloak the sun now because we've articulated um, our vantage point, the massing here, and it holds as a perspective of what's gonna sort of take this and make it seem like it's more has a presence on the stage is to um, work with the value of the Southern light. So if the sun is coming, um, let's say mid-morning, so we have a direct distinction between the west and the south. If it's later in the morning or early afternoon, it's gonna light up both of our facades. And that's great for photography, but it's harder for a sketch. We're gonna make sure the south is only in the, the, um, the southern side, the sun's hitting the southern side. So that means all of our western faces here are gonna be washed out. So we work with the side of the pencil. and just make your way from east to west across the property. And every time you see the plane that's facing west, it receives the initial level of gray darkness, which is probably maybe 20, 30% right now. Uh, this is actually then this plane is floating over, so the sun's coming down and hitting that with an angle of light, so it's brighter here on the stone, but less beneath it and on the underside. So that shows that the glass for that lower uh, kindergarten area is pressed in, it's on the outside skin. And then of course you've got the panels that hold up the roof, or cloaked on the other side there. And then the inner side of the roof proper, it is a lighter tone color, but we're going to use a gray now as we get darker and darker later on. So we're going to wash this with the same type of tone to start with, and we'll retreat with something a little bit dark for the rest of the home later. Would that allocate the idea that this is working as an environmentally sound type of um, passive design where it's not driven by comfort, by power. It's done by the actual shape and character of the massing, the form making. So in this case, the whole premise is the cantilever is out far enough so that the high winter sun, when it comes up, will strike here and cloak all the glazing in a shadow or a shade. And that means you're not gonna have the greenhouse effect of heating the, the home when the sun strikes glazing. The lower winter sun actually hit that same dimension and light the glass because you want the home to receive the energy in the winter. And so that was manifest again back in the first decade of the 20th century. And it seems like it should be an important part of housing design in our culture today. And so we'll wash a little bit of value of this tree coming down and kind of cloak in that corner and kind of its trunk on the one side coming down to grade. And then we can wash the whole base because the dark green of the lawn is always a great reference point next to 
the brights of bricks and stone are receiving sunlight directly. And then a distance here, uh, just to give a sense of the, the termination of the property. If this is the height of a tree here, and it's kind of similar to what the major urban tree will be planted there, the scale of that down here says that same size tree on a, on a neighboring lot would also be the same height, but a perspective diminished in terms of size. And so we can use those to kind of set off the backdrop here a little bit in the distance. And then potentially coming off over here, we could use some vegetation on the north side of the property, which will help commit to this corner as well. So starting to bounce off the, the site a little bit, our next step is to go a little bit deeper with value, maybe with a little bit sharper pencil because it's a smaller zone. And we're going to work with the idea of the interior having, um, even in the daylight where it seems like it could be a bright, well, that space in the inside by the sun, when you have the sun and its foot candles outside compared to electric light on the inside, it can't compare so that these tones inside the space are much darker. And here are our tones in the living space, which are gonna let us see through to that tree on the other side. And these will just see into more of the interior. So these will be more consistently just dark. And as we make our way through the array of casement windows, there's just a pattern of very dark spaces along that battery up to the second floor as well. But to save that little bit of light here because we're gonna look into the space and see sky and light on the other side of it. So we don't wanna to be too monolithic with it. But that'll help animate the interior spaces here. We see a little bit of glazing once we get to the room over here, just beyond this corner. So we come to the edge of that detail and pull that down. And so it shows that how you can then actively see into the space and through it from the corner vantage point we have here. Now, the next step here is to uh, look at some of the detail that was part of why this thing became saved several times in the course of the 20th century and went from being a single family residence from a young uh, American architect that was noteworthy, but I don't think the 20th century really knew what they had there over the course of the decades. So that when the Theological Seminary really bought the house from uh, a man in 1926, they used it as a dorm and as a dining hall, but they really saw it as future expansion someday when they wanted to grow their site at the university campus, they would tear down the Roby house. So um, at one point, a graduate student from IIT who was going to school there actually discovered the seminary was moving ahead with the plan to demolish the Roby house. And this was probably in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. And it happened that his instructor was Mies van der Rohe, who we'll get to in a second in terms of one of the other great four modern masters. And so Mies van der Rohe took part in the idea of understanding how important this was to his colleagues in Europe and in the course of the 20th century, realizing that can't possibly happen. So finally in 1858, um, University of Chicago uh, donated the building. Then it became on the commission of Chicago landmarks, which kind of secured it. And eventually in 2019, I mentioned before, when the restoration was completed, it was added to UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So it's, it's the ultimate quintessential prairie house that we're dealing with here. We're gonna to try to articulate some of those details here, which won't be quite in the rendered state, but they articulate more of the sensation, which makes it the Roby. So one of the things we wanna do is come to uh, the idea of the, the quality of it, because now it could be plaster or stone, but it's brick. So what we wanna do is the, the key aspect that's closest to us, we can detail a bit more, and we'll simply articulate the pattern of lights and darks here, moving from the corner on down. Not necessarily all the way through and do the same thing here too. So there's sort of a sense of horizontal rush. It starts at that corner and turns and heads over there. And if you do it just enough here, we don't have to do it in the whole house, just enough to establish that movement of line work. A little bit down here from that corner going down. 
And then people get the sense that maybe it reads more like a brick sculpt, uh, housing here, and we can turn the corner and kind of go back this way a little bit too. And then stop and we get to that base element. And so what we've done so far in terms of the language of uh, developing this is we've worked from the page white to liner to perspective. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and then move value from the original 20 or 30% to the 40s and 50s and maybe 60s or 70s here. And now our idea is to work in that middle ground to tease out more information in the, in the fat of the sketch, this upper third we want to give attention to. And then the, arch the architectural detail will diminish the move in the backdrop, which enhances the idea of depth because any type of view shed a human would have of a building in the front, if you're looking at this area, it's your peripheral view that sees down here and you can't really see the detail if you're looking here, you'd have to turn your head and look down there to see that detail. So a drawing this type of idea with under an hour here, 40 minute sketch, it had that idea of a very degree of information across the path. And so we're gonna articulate more up here. So a really important prow here on our ship is this edge and that's gonna go fairly dark and then turn that corner with a little bit of a profile with a built-in guttering system and then anchor back down and we'll see a little bit more of the depth of that whole fascia of this copper edge here turn that corner and that becomes darker and darker right at that point where we turn the corner. Then we're gonna do the same thing here with the underside where the woodwork trim for what happens here along that edge is darkest because it's a darker tone of paint on that wood, but it's also in the shade for the building proper. And then because there is a little bit of a, um, milky tone of the stained glass and the room the interior plus you're going to a second piece of glass look up in the sky that won't be as bright as the paper so we can gloss over that a little bit but it still has that movement inside there now to come to front here to make sure this prow has its potential to really punctuate in this corner we want to activate this corner as well so profile of the limestone kicks out at top and at the base, returns the corner, comes to this edge. And now what will happen is in terms of uh, the way he'll corner things, sometimes he'll accentuate, for instance, the pier on this level. So we can come around and kind of do some of the brickwork to show that pier. But then what happens across the plane is we know that this is all in shade. It doesn't get direct sunlight. But what happens is right here, it's meeting the part that's being lit by the sun so that that shade side to the human eye appears to be darker right where it meets that corner. And that'll accentuate that corner and help pour that, pull that out now. So now it seems like with that little dark added there, it seems like this is lit to a greater degree, which is also the inverse when we come to these piers which are shrouded where we can say, this is actually then an even darker section of the wall against that pier coming down to grade. And this is an important shift between the edges as well too. So that'll run across there. And so all we gotta do is keep pulling out these ideas to articulate Wright's presence in terms of uh, uh, particularly the language of what builds out the massing of a, the, the pure prairie home here. And right would be obviously known, you've read about this too, all the interiors, the windows, lighting, rugs, furniture, textiles, because of this idea of him being a fractal architect. And the fractal is a real simple principle that it comes from mathematics. In this case, it deals with scale change on the site. So he's dealing with the language, and we'll use our carpet here, to show kind of the height of the edge of the grass. But the language of where he's building is part of how he designs. And so that itself, the urban scale is the largest scale he's sort of taxed with on this. Maybe we should put a little bit of the vegetative growth on this side too. 
and then probably to help out have the sidewalk sit down a bit you can take the baseline back to that vanishing point from this one that one over this one over and have those construction joints in the in the walkway kind of help settle and and sit that down on the ground so that seems like a feature that's actually in the horizontal plane because if you don't draw on paper it looks like it could be a vertical plane so you need that horizontality the horizon line the vanishing points to give you that sense of scale there so we don't want to push too much of that change in there all the way through but we will come to the tower before we stop and show this edge of that masonry the brickwork there being stronger where it meets the part of the masonry which is lit up by the sun. And then the edge of the roof line has to pull off of that. So that's a big chance for a dark to run in front of the lights behind it. And so forth and down. And then finally off to the distance where we see the underside of both this plane and the back airplane and how that has a nice strong return against the sky in the backdrop. So now we're getting some power in our ship here. We can uh, go inside some of the rooms now and kind of pull out some of the darkest elements, which will be getting to our 70, 80, 90% blacks because it's nice to have the tone be darker there, but there could be more animation within that. For instance, there could be something in the ceiling here, which is an even darker object which is in this case, it's just abstracted, but it goes to absolute black periodically to uh -huh. inhabit change inside the space itself. So down here by the kindergarten area, and then just periodically, not the entire sheet of glass, it could be just a change in the stained glass detailing up there, but it gives more romance and activity behind that glazing area. Okay, now to, to help this out, because it's a um, it's a projection of the sun that's coming from the west, and we want the building to really anchor itself in the earth here, because these are of the prairie, of the land themselves. So it seems like it's part of the natural culture that drove this tree to rise out of this part of the ground. That's what happened on the house or the Roby house here at the site. So if it's going to come and hit this in, in great light, it's going to take beyond this pier and cast a little bit of a shadow so that the grass is darker right at the base of this pier and has a darker edge there so that this little bit will actually cast a little shadow on that wall too. So now it's gonna sit down more there and then be bright at the base. And again, at this point here, it's gonna cast a shadow and then this wall will actually throw a little bit of dark tone on that wall as it rides over here. And so those little thrusts of anchoring it down to the grass level shows the ability of this plane coming down and projecting a dark shadow on top of that. So there's the line that's lit, but on this side, it actually throws something a little bit darker, which obviously um, earlier in the morning, that would have been a greater shadow cast. If it was like eight in the morning, this plane of shadow cast would be much lighter, or, uh, more intense. So this goes around the corner and on the other side, because now when the summer sun in the morning hits this, it's taking this whole plinth and casting a shadow on the northern part of the property. So that little bit of anchoring that part of the sketch on that back side really creates a place for that building to sit down there. Okay, we're going to sort of animate this a little bit in terms of showing the variance in grass and show something not quite so monolithic and maybe the edge of it because it faces that brilliance of the sidewalk being lit by the sun. It's darker on this part and then washes to lighter and lighter grays. It gets to the backdrop. We'll take the underside of the vegetation, which casts a shadow on itself. And all the cases here and make that a little bit bolder. And this is sort of using just the edge of the conical shape of the pencil in various directions to get sort of like a, a leafy kind of quality edge. Like the, it's not so much the body we're worried about in terms of this tree, it's more of a shaper for delineating the, the framing of the sketch. And so we just want the edge of it to have that condition of something more natural. And this one could have a little on its head here. That's further away, so less of the information there. And then these can sit down with smaller 
branches or tree trunks that'll support them in the right over there. Take a dead. And we'll kind of pull this tree up by saying on the one side, which faces north, it's going to have a dark aspect to it. And then this tree will come down and will cast a shadow on the grade next to it on the grass and then across the sidewalk at a little bit of an angle and then run over here and kind of faint out as it hits the building and probably not cast too much of a shadow here, but at least it links the tree to the property of the site itself. So it's, it's promised in the 20th century, which obviously has been well authenticated by myriads of architecture. I think I mentioned that uh, since Wright first wrote the first piece of article about himself, self-promotion, uh, there's been 4,500 other things written about Wright, full books, essays, articles, records, videos, things like that in terms of publicity for Wright. Uh, some of the biggest ones, the highlights over the years are really about the iconic status of architects and how they're seen. That would have been through uh, periodicals. And so the architectural record, which was the dominant one in the 20th century, uh, selected the Roby House as one of the seven most notable residences ever built in America in 1956. And this is really before Wright was kind of rediscovered because his whole career went fairly dormant in the 50s and 60s and the 70s. And a lot of towns didn't know what they had sitting right next to them. In 1957, the article um, in House at Home was also a big boost to his career because by then he, he's uh, 57, he would have been 89. And, you know, the when the whole decades of eclecticism triumph, there were also many innovators along the way and none could really, was more heralded and outside the fashion than Frank Lloyd Wright was. It's um, kind of the house of the 20th century, the house of the 20th century. In 91, the uh, American Institute of Architects named the Roby House the top all-time work of any American architect. This building, they, they solicited that, they agreed that in consensus that this has got the most sense of what American architecture is about as a piece. And then on the popular culture to kind of frame that in making this really odd because architects really aren't in the public lexicon, Lego released a 200, 2,276 piece model set of the Roby House that's on the marketplace. And that kind of brought it up to an even higher level. And then in 2013, the PBS documentary came out and talked about 10 buildings that changed America. All the way back from Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, the Roby House is in that too, that it simply changed America in terms of the culture. But for us, in the course of the semester, the most important part is it's number two of our list in terms of dates. We're going to put this chronologically, Unity Temple being one, and now we're at the Roby House, and then soon after, uh, we'll be doing um, Taliesin, which is what, it sort of it mirrors this on a different site, because this is him before he has the devastating personal choices of 1909, then the sort of triumphant return back from uh, Europe, and he starts construction on Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin. So uh, the impact of this was Wasmuth. I want to show you a couple of uh, springboard projects in the course of the modern century, 20th century, the modernism, which frames Wright as one of the four modern masters. Now, along the way, this portfolio goes and it gets published in German, gets translated to multiple languages and becomes this lexicon of modernism for the modern movement. And then in no particular order, it impacts the other three major modernists. And we'll start with Walter Gropius at the Bauhaus from 1925, when they finally had enough success uh, as a school of design with architecture as a component of it, where they could sort of liberate themselves from past historical pastiches. This is Gropius design for the school proper in Dessau, Germany, um, pre-war Germany in the 1920s, and eventually closed out in 1933 by the Nazi party because of its provocative non-German tendencies to it. So um, 
but the, the, the light of right in terms of movement of pieces around certain geometric patterns influenced Gropius and the designers of that as part of that, again, the lexicon of the modern age. And probably none as much as in the idea of what Usonia did and what Wright then learned from the modern. This is Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona from 1929. Uh, sorry about the model, just a little droopiness there, but it's hard to get plastic to hold its form making as much as the material in Barcelona does. This was built just for an exhibition in 1929 for the German government, supposed to be a one year and out. And so they tore it down right away and then became infamous in the 20th century as one of the top 10 buildings in the modern movement, along with the Roby House, along with the Bauhaus in Dessau. So that's number three. And number four is the Swiss French architect, Le Corbusier, who we all know probably unmistakably for the Villa Savoy, which is sort of a housing notion that it's an object type itself, that houses aren't indicative of style, they're indicative of purpose and engineered use. And so the formula here is this is a system of how people should live. Again, raised off the ground out of like the Roby house with a floating idea of technology supporting life there and a horizontal view of the landscape. So not sort of iconically tied directly to prayer language, but you could see where some of the things that Wright had uh, ruminated in that first decade from 1900 with the first one at um, on Sheridan Drive in Highland Park, the first home there until the last master house in 1909 here. The four modern masters then are the sort of the iconic story of the 20th century and how today we're still encapsulated in what really most people refer to as the late modern movement, that we're still in modernism and a later part of the phase to it beyond the postmodern into just the, the core principles that came from a uh, school of architecture, eventually Taliesin doing some educational pieces, uh, Mies van der Rohe eventually evolving with um, IIT in Chicago as a school of architecture, and Corbu that really never affiliated with one until Later days, he would work um, periodically on the East Coast, but never associated one singular school for one time. So that's our pathway that gets from colloquial, local, suburban America to the breadth and power of the modern movement of the 20th century and into the 21st century. And our celebrated piece today is the Roby House from 1909. So we'll come back in and finish our titling down here real quick. It's now um, open to the public. It's one of the sites you can choose to see or two sites you're gonna to get to in the course. I would, I can't imagine you'd even stop it to because if you travel, you see major monuments and now you know you're within a two hours drive of one of the most glorious things on the planet. Why wouldn't you make an effort to go down there and, and tour the facility? It works somehow in cohesion with the Oak Park Home and Studio as well. I think it's the same group now that's gone through the restoration process and brought it up to speed. I'm not sure they're ticketed the same way, but uh, they're both powerhouses of framing Wright's life from sort of the dawn of the 1880s, 1890s through the prairie period up to this area. And also on the same street, there's a couple other prairie homes as well as a couple off of Woodlawn proper in the University of Chicago area you can see too. So that's it for today. If you have questions, just stay on the line. Uh, and then I will, again, kind of type this up in the response to kind of in text in terms of what I'd like submitted before 11 o'clock. I'll stop receiving emails at 11 and start printing things out. So it gives me a good chunk of time to look at all of your preliminary schematic designs and almost the stuff that you don't want to show to the client. You're just talking about it with your friends in the office before it actually germinates. But that's for me the most exciting part of design where you nuance the initial strokes towards the idea. So moving somehow from this to this, if you choose your Sony over the course of time, uh, where it's minutes to hours and days spent in articulating the plan to make sure it's a very articulate, sensitive home for your users. So next up, next week, oh, two weeks then after this is Taliesin and Proper. And that's obviously his home and studio from 1911 until he died in 1959. Hi. 
Hi, I have a question. Sure. So what exactly do you want submitted by next week, Tuesday? Well, this isn't exactly, but I can show you. second piece here. Assuming you start with a plan, uh, to a type of scale, that's why I suggest using some type of gridded paper you can print from any number of sites, whether it's eighth inch or quarter inch. Just get it so you see you're sort of like always true to scale and size of things, just in a global sense. Then at a certain point, you've, you've talked enough about your program idea that you're going to have some type of sketch of a floor plan. Now, as long as it's two scale, you can make it 16th inch or 3 eighths, whatever you want, but it, it, it'd be nice if it fit on a, just one or two pages tops. And then from that, you're going to present it like Wright would to a client and not do elevations and not do a section. Just show them what the house looks like. And typically, there's two views, sort of the more public view and the more private view. And so in the case of Jacob's one is such a small house. There's really only two views of the house. The rest is just sort of the, the back of yards, north end. So here's their private area to the southeast, and here's their public area to the uh, sort of southwest, the face of that corner of the property. And really, at that kind of quality, just kind of a hand sketch like that, that's all I need to see, because between these three things, I can kind of tell relatively where the class is amongst the 63 of us and who needs a little bit more help. And what I'll do is, I'll take your work that you give to me, 11 by 17 as sort of the platen format. And when I print it out, I can draw directly into those. So by the time class starts, uh, the feedback will be graphic as well as oral. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So, okay. um, so is this just like a floor plan? Like, is this project just like something that we design ourselves? Is it a single family house or? Something I think I missed what it right. Was. So obviously, Wright is by and far known for residential design. So I'm assuming you chose a seminar on Wright because you've been interested, and you've been you're instantly piqued by his skill sets on this kind of building type. So what better way rather than write about it? You should just dive in and become Wright and design within his language, and that's how you prove to me that you're you're working within that. You you're fully understanding as a graphic and not just as text. So in that being said, out of 60 people, there might be an off chance where people actually know people who are contemplating building a single family residence somewhere. And that's where I said about a dozen students who told me they've got clients, they've got a site, they wanna do this, can I make it this big, can I make it that big? And it really doesn't matter to me the scale, this could be a cabin, it could be you know a second home up north, it could be vacation home in Florida, whatever you want, it could be your dream house just for you, you could be your own client. Uh, but it's really kind of typical of a lot of architects. They're in college and their first practice job is somebody they know, a friend or a family member who wants architecture and they're gonna trust you with their money and that's how your career is gonna start. So we did Unity Temple, that was for Wright's uncle. So that's how he got the job really. His uncle was working on a dime and knew Wright could practice and do it in concrete and make it cheap. And so he knew that he could trust Wright to do that building. So at this point in Wright's career, it's post-depression and he's got to do something everybody's going to like and it's going to be cheap. So that's where your career is. You guys are in college. You're all juniors and seniors, a lot of grad students. You're engineers in Madison. You're about to step in the profession. Why wait? Let's just do it now. It really takes a handful of hours to talk about schematic design. Then we fine-tune it all semester so it is a true semester-long project. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. I just, I just think that, uh, you know, particularly for the seniors and graduates, you've been in so many studios. This is just what you're supposed to be doing, and it's, it's funny. I always, I always kind of tease students when, I, when they say, "Oh, that's like you're asking too much for a seminar." Well, your clients are going to wait for you. They want their work now, and you want to have as many clients as possible. So you got to learn how to. Like, this is your, this is your joy. This is your love. You want to design something. Somebody says, can you do me a house? You say, heck yes, I can. And you're, you work on it that night. You just get after it. You don't wait for um, 
the grade to come through or what does it do? You, this is what you're born to do. This is your choice. This is your, this is your career. This is your lifestyle. So I, I think historically we've done this class for about 27 years now. And I think the students really kind of enjoy doing houses typically. And again, it's just schematic design. There's no Revit. There's no cost relationship. Um, I'll tell you how much your house will cost once I see the final product, but you don't have to worry about that now. Just have fun with it and prove to me that you've been looking at it right. Other questions? And then for the biographies that were that we read. Yep. Um, so with what are we doing with that? Is there going to be like a project based on that or? Right. Well, your uh, final exam will give me enough proof to see how you wrote about right in the essays or answered questions and some of the most, you know, most pronounced facts that sort of developed him as a, as a man, as an architect, as an individual. Um, so there's, there's really big low hanging fruit in all those biographies, which are actually kind of sensational in terms of how his life got laid out. And you have to know those things to understand how do you generate a career of architecture like this? What creates that genius? And a lot of it is just the culture of his life and the people and his family and his friends and the people he met. If you don't know that, it's way too abstract. And so I think the three bios are just enjoyable enough that it reads fast. Like you're, it's almost like a, um, you know, a serial that you'd see on TV or something on Netflix where the story just keeps unfolding. He keeps coming back from, you know, what is perceived as the end of his career and he mounts this comeback all the time. And it's, it absolutely makes it, he's cataclysmic in the 20th century. So it's, and it's going to be dovetailed into your work too then. So it should show up somehow in how you portray the work and the quality you want to achieve because this is, in a, in a sense, your gift back to Mr. Wright. And that's how Taliesin did their design projects. The students would design something for Mr. Wright to prove they were listening, that they bought in, that they're, they understand that culture of design. And it's just, you can't divorce the story from the work, from the man. And so it's just, it's obligatory to read a biography on Wright for any Wright seminar. Okay, that makes sense. Other questions? Anybody else? M, Peyton, Kyle, Sean, Tanner? M? I guess. Um uh how detailed do you want the plans to be i guess for next week like is there should it be like almost exact measurements or just kind of like roughly what it should be about for room sizes well you know um i know what your 15 credit semester is like um and sometimes that's um that's limiting to what you can do in a seminar without being in a studio for 15 or 18 hours but i also think you guys are all advanced in college and this should be um this should be so enjoyable that you're unstoppable and so i want your best work can i say that i want your best work i don't want to have you spend 20 hours on this but i want your best work yes. and i think this should come easier with every suit you take that you know how to get after schematic design so that you're a real benefit to the firms that are going to hire you you can just jump in there and start producing stuff and hours later, you can talk about the ideas. That's what we're looking for, right? This is, you, the, the client called at noon and said, hey, we got this client that wants this house on this acreage and they want something in the prairie style Usonian. Can you help us out? And, you know, later in the afternoon, you've got something to show. That's, that's what architecture is in the beginning. It's just flying through ideas. And you've got to have that skill set to be able to generate you know, ideas of two and three dimensions very quickly. So I wouldn't say X, everybody has to do X and X amount of time and this amount of detail. 
I'm just going to sh- look at 63 projects and I will have excellent work and I will have poor work because that's what happens when you have a class of 63. All right, thank you. Hopefully sure. I'll do my best. Yep. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thanks, Abby. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask, I, get, I don't know if this is just me, but I still haven't been able to find the lecture recordings. They're in, oh, lecture, rec- like tonight or the ones that are on Canvas? Um, so I see the ones on, I can see the ones on Canvas. Yeah. But um, I don't see like, like the uh, Tuesday lecture that we have. Because they're not on week. Canvas, right? They're yeah. the ones that are on my OneDrive. Right. And I don't think I'm on that. I, unless I'm like blind. Sorry, that's my dog. There must be a siren outside. Um, all right. Well, Sean, I'll just send you the link one more time there. It's, you know, okay. it's in all those emails and stuff. You just have to go through that. It, it's, um, it's just, a, it comes, what does it do? It, when I uh, finish the film tonight, it mm-hmm. says, who do you want to send it to? And I'll send it to you the email and you guys are on the email. And then it'll also send it to me and then I'll copy that and send it right back to the email a second time. So I think between January 15th and tonight, it's probably been in your email 10 times in terms of that link. So just make sure you find that and dig it through and use that. Because um, you know, once you're there, you just um, you know hold that aspect tight. And again, students ask, well, why isn't this all on Canvas? And that's because we're, again, we're at three universities. And right. unfortunately, they all use different Canvas licenses. Right. So the only way they actually that can streamline this at all is through email. And the universities don't care about that. They all protect their rights to their canvas. So I can't talk to Madison and I can't talk to Platteville through our canvas. So mm-hmm. it's nuts. Cuts me off. So you just have to, you know, I'm not going to email you guys every day. I'm going to email you two or three times a week. So you got to do stuff on email for me two or three times a week. Or I mean, look at stuff on email. Yeah. Um. So I only have like the two that we have as a, as a conversation and the only link i have is for this zoom meeting uh the two what um two emails and then within them are just like short conversations um but only one of them contains a link and it's for zoom uh, and then was that uh when did you jo- join the class Sean? so i was one of the students that joined late um late meaning when like i think a week before class started yeah that's not late that's not late because at that point i was still adding people to the um so oh, what, sorry, also, sorry, what also sorry, happened not... because of because of the three institutions for some reason once they said platteville and madison student couldn't auto populate into the class on an email they said yeah. uwm can't either so for some reason, uh, I think most of the students from UWM got to for a certain point, and then they stopped letting people, if you enrolled late, you just became part of the email. And unless you actually ask me now, I don't know if you're in the email or not. It's just one of those technical things when we're working with three colleges where it's you'd think technology would solve the problem, and it actually just makes it harder. So I'll just go back, and I'll go back to those same five emails I sent out last week. To somebody who just joined last week, like last Tuesday, somebody joined, and it's got all the content there, and I'll send it to you directly because okay, it would have gone you. to it would have gone to the batch email, and maybe you didn't see that or something, or it wasn't linking you to it. I don't know. Yeah, but you're getting I'm an email, sure. right? You're getting an email. Um, for today, from me, you're getting an email from me. Yeah, yeah, which is weird because. That that means you're not. I'm not sending it to Sean. I'm sending it to 390, 790, and you're in that class. So why you're not getting the rest of the stuff everybody else has is is a mystery to me. So I'll try again. Okay. Do you have your book? Yeah, I got my book, and I got. Have you been the, uh, your book? Yeah. Oh, I've been, okay. Yeah, I've been up Good. to date with those. So. 
Yeah, and the, if the first two sessions you miss those, once you get this OneDrive thing, you're gonna see those two. It'll take you right. three yeah, hours. Because I just want to try to like do the. Uh, I think it was the Unity drawing that you said. Which one? Yeah, Unity Temple. Yeah, it was that yep. was uh, two weeks ago. The first. Yeah. Week. Yeah, and those but, things um, are all kind of judged or juried end of semester anyway. So um, it's piecemeal. The, the biggest thing for me on an ongoing basis is moving your project from schematic design to design development. Mm -hmm. Everything else is kind of in your time frame, whatever you want it. There's, you know, there's a a third. They're just taking this whole thing async. They're just, you know, doing it on their own time frame. So, which reminds me, I should probably be ending this now so i can send it out to them tonight all righty okay yeah um oh just one last thing um, yeah. do you want the plan drawings like on a graph paper versus over digital no no you can do it if you want to do the digital on that's fine that, a lot of students in the class um that that's a burden for them time-wise to mm -hmm. hit digital technology to make a presentation it kind of sucks the time away from them so i think i just proved tonight that you could do something in 30 minutes that right. talks about your ideas too and so that's another pathway it's your choice you're the designer you see what you want to do all right sounds good okay and then sean like I, again in the email which you probably didn't get i told the whole class that my semester has worked out that i'm in my office 295 from like noon to 1 30 every tuesday and thursday tuesday and thursday okay and i'm just hanging out you know working other stuff and research and if you want to talk about something just pop in all right yeah because i'm on campus th those days so yeah yeah and that's that's so weird these days i have this discussion with my kids all the time because it seems like nobody's ever in the building anymore and nobody's ever on campus because there's so much just post pandemic malaise and people doing a lot of online this and that that I don't know it's kind of odd anyway yeah I'll, I'll do that again let me get these uh, videos up and then once they're up I'll send you those five <laughs> emails but make sure you check your email you know I, I usually do something first of the week the day before the Tuesday class and last of the week just to make sure people are kind of up to snuff here yeah, weird. I've I've never gotten those certain emails. Just yeah, okay. Once I've well, emailed you, we'll check it out. I mean, I'm I'm not going to look at the email chain because you said you're receiving emails, so it can't be that you're not on that. But I don't know. All right. Well, All right. Very good. Have a good night. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Bye. -bye.